Welcome to our Breakfast with a Boss, sponsored by Fidelity Bank. Show of hands, how many folks went to the Downs Common Center this morning? I know they're, I know they're out there. So I apologize. We did email you a few times. Um, I know we email you a lot anyways, um, so it's easy to overlook. So, um, But I want to say that our next breakfast will also be here, so just a heads up. Um, a quick housekeeping request, please take a moment to turn your cell phones on mute or off is fine also. We are so appreciative of the support and partnerships that we have with the businesses in Neshoba Valley. As you know, it is our mission and our passion to help businesses and the support of our corporate sponsors really allows us the opportunity to continuously look for new ideas and ways to do that. Please join me as we recognize our corporate sponsors that are with us today. Please stand when I call your name. We have Cheryl and Nadia from Enterprise Bank and Jim Adams. We have Holly Clark from Mount Juice Community College. Kip Detler from Watts Bass Group. We have Laura and Chris from Rollstone Bank and Trust. And of course, I didn't say your name and you'd love for it to be recognized. Let's chat about sponsorships. <laughs> of course, we wouldn't be here at the Fidelity Bank Breakfast with the Boss without our breakfast sponsor, Fidelity Bank. They have been a supporter and a sponsor of the Neshoba Valley Chamber for over 20 years. This is, I'm, we're coming up on my 22nd year um, here at the Chamber. And we are so excited to always partner with Fidelity Bank. And I would love to welcome up Joe Silva of Fidelity to say a few words and tell us what Fidelity has been up to. Joe. Good morning, everyone. I told uh, Jim this morning that I was going to sing. But if I did that, everybody would have wished they were the other building. <laughs> I'm going to skip that for everybody. So. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, great to be here. You know, we appreciate all the work that Melissa and uh, the Chamber does, and thank you for your support. Uh, there's so many very important issues on the table right now, and your, your membership for the Chamber and the Chamber's advocacy uh, couldn't be any more critical than it is now. So thank you, everyone, for your support. And a round of applause for Melissa and everyone. So um, I'm pleased today to be joined by a table full of wonderful colleagues. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand, um, uh, we, we'd love to love to meet with anyone here that we haven't had the chance to meet with. Uh, we talk a lot about our life design making promise, where we give you the clarity you need to move forward with confidence in a time like this. That's probably never more important with the world spinning as fast as it is. So, if we haven't had a chance to meet, would love the chance to meet. Please stop by, and we'll hang around for a little while. A little while. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joe. So everybody's using ChatGPT now, right? I, and I typed in, what makes a good community leader in my ChatGPT prompt? And I received a list of 15 key traits and characteristics that contribute to being a great community leader. My three favorite are Visionary, they have a clear vision for the community's future and inspire others to work towards common goals. Integrity, they act with honesty, fairness, and transparency, earning the trust and respect of those they lead. And collaboration, great community leaders collaborate with other stakeholders, organizations, and individuals to maximize resources and achieve common objectives. By embodying these qualities and acting engagingly, with the community, great leaders can inspire positive change, foster a sense of belonging, and create a thriving and vibrant community for everyone. Today, we would like to recognize four businesses for their leadership in the Shiva Valley. Nick Glass Painting and Construction. It has been 25 years since Steve Demolis started Nick Glass Painting and Construction. The company is named after Steve's son, Nick Glass. It, it isn't without the business. Nick Glass isn't with the business. But thanks to the business, he has an MBA and is working in the technology sector. I love to ask people what their first job was. Steve's had been working practically since childhood, started at a suitcase factory in downtown Nashua. He started Nicholas Painting and Construction in Cambridge, moving to Concord, and eventually to Groton. 
His parents moved from Greater Boston to Pepperell in order to staff the gas company office in Pepperell. And the Themelis family has been there ever since. Nicholas Painting does both residential and commercial work, including remodeling and insurance. Examples include anything from trim replacement to decks and windows. Steve started hiring workers early in the life of the business, and many of his crew, which can be up to 12 during busy seasons, have been with him for many years. How has Nicholas Painting into Construction been in business for 25 years? You can't talk to Steve without the conversation, including working hard, goals, dreams, treating people with respect, and living a life of service. That's also true for Steve outside of work. In his hometown of Pepperell, he serves on the planning board, the select board, and currently sits on the board of health. And he's even working on the town's 250th committee. In Steve's free time, which doesn't sound like he has much, uh, he enjoys Salisbury Beach with his family. Please join me in congratulating Steve Nellis on celebrating his 25th anniversary of Nicholas Painting and Construction. Thank you. I'll treasure this forever. <laughs> uh, it's been uh, 25 years been great. Uh, I want to thank my wife, Joyce, of course, for all support. We've been married about 30 years. My son, Nicholas, is 25, works for Juniper Networks in, in Westford. He's a good boy. That helps a lot. My parents, you know, World War II generation, brought me up strong. Work ethic and uh, conservatism, and, and uh, it's all been great. They're both deceased now, but uh, I want to thank Melissa, uh, you know, the chamber, uh, the staff, the board of directors, and all our businesses that are part of this chamber for all your support. And I want to support you also as well. And uh, they say there's an old adage, take care of your business, you take your business will take care of you. It's true. Six times is a job for me. <laughs> so uh, thank you again. Appreciate it. I forgot to mention, at the end of the breakfast, um, I'll ask all of the um, award winners up to bring your awards up, and we'll do photos. Our next recipient is Natural River Watershed. The Natural River Watershed Association was founded in 1969 and has attained international recognition for their success in driving the cleanup of one of the nation's most polluted rivers. In 1966, the North Natural River was unable to support life except for sludge worms. Gross. <laughs> Today, the land that drains into the Nashua River and its tributaries involves 32 communities in north central Mass in southern New Hampshire and in, in, is a thriving watershed. The association's goal is to protect the Nashua River watershed, including both water and land resources now and for the future. A regional organization, the NRWA, works across municipal board boundaries and forms partnerships with government officials and agencies, community leaders, educators, and funders to accomplish both large and small scale projects. Scores of individuals and organizations, business partners, including many members of the Neshoba Valley Chamber, have worked with the NRWA through the years. Current projects include monitoring cold water, temperatures to protect fish, such as native trout, assessing culverts for wildlife passage, community education to prevent tick bites and tick-borne diseases, and removing patches of invasive water chestnut. Today, the work of the NRWA continues using environmental education as a key strategy to preserve our nature's resources, educating not just children through their river classroom program, but educators and other community leaders and professionals. The NRWA works to protect drinking water supplies, monitor river water quality and quantity, and create riverside greenways. They participate in collaborative projects to protect forests and farmlands, encourage land stewardship, and help communities use sustainable land tools in planning processes. As a result of their work, our home is beautiful, has beautiful rivers and streams, an abundant diversity of flora and fauna, and a wide array of recreational opportunities. Please join me in thanking and recognizing the Nashville River Watershed Association for their 55 years, helping make Neshoba Valley a great place to work, live, and play. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I just wanted to thank my team who's here, Cheryl Serpy, one of our directors, and Laurie Johnson, our director of development. 
Um, we've had a lot of exciting projects going on this past year. Um, <clears throat> we have a, um, a project um, um, developing nature-based solutions to climate change, um, which is a, a something new, and um, projects ranging from that to um, uh, uh, monitoring water quality um, within the watershed. And uh, just thank you very much. Thanks to the chamber, and we're really honored to receive this award. It's hard to believe that anyone in Neshoba Valley hasn't been to Kimball Farms. Today, they offer not just 50 flavors of their famous homemade ice cream, but so much more. Based in Westford with locations in Lancaster, Carlisle, and Jaffrey, Kimball's creates the, celebrates their 85th anniversary in 2024. Who here can guess the most popular ice cream flavor sold at Kimball's, not including vanilla chocolate and strawberry? I'll tell you the answer later. When we say fun activities, we're talking about tons of fun. In addition to ice cream, there's the grill and seafood, the Outback Tap Shack for light fare and local craft beer, the Country Store and Cafe, there's mini golf with two 18 horse, 18 hole courses, including the nine hole handicap accessible course. There's a driving range, pitch and putt, the Grand Slam batting cages, bumper boats, bumper cars, and the soaring zip line, and tons more. My favorite story about Kimball's. Who here is familiar with the Kimball special? So you know the giant banana slip, but without the bananas. So the, origin, the origins of the special date to the Second World War, when bananas were rationed. By Tuesday of every week, the Kimball family would have run out of bananas for their banana slip. And so the special was born. Kimball Farms of today sure isn't the Kimball's that your dad remembers or that I remember, we, that we remember. Ice cream now includes not just classic flavors, but special flavors, frozen yogurt, sherbet sorbet, and sugar-free, and even vegan options. Group options, <laughs> can hear you, Karen. <laughs> Group options using the expansive outdoor tented space are super easy to arrange. Whether it's a corporate event, a wedding, a family reunion, or a club outing, events can be customized. Spend an hour or spend a day with family and friends or coworkers. There's fun for everyone at Kimball Farms. Stay tuned for the 2024 opening date. And outside of chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry, the most popular flavor is, does anybody have a guess? Chocolate chip. Black Ross coffee. Mint chocolate. Mint Oreo and coffee Oreo with cookie dough as a close encounter. So congratulations to Kimball Farms on their 85th anniversary. Oh, perfect. Um, well, thank you to the Chamber for this. Um, obviously, we're going into our 85th season. We're so lucky to still be family owned and run by the Kimballs. Um, a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Spring opening date is coming soon. Um, and we hope to see you there this summer. You'll have to let us know so we can yes, come Yes, definitely. <laughs> we'll do. Thank you. Because we'll be there. <laughs> Electrical is celebrating 95 years of business. It was founded in 1929 by William Piper in Leominster, who managed the business until 1975. Today, it is owned and operated by his grandson, Daniel E. Piper. The company now has over 20 employees and has a division in southern New Hampshire. Piper Electrical Company provides custom solutions for your electrical, electronic, and energy management needs. The electrical division provides a full range of industrial electrical services and solutions to a wide range of businesses. The services include machine control circuit design, high voltage design and maintenance services, 24 hour emergency service, bucket truck service, building and parking lot light service, and more. Industrial electronics service include preventative maintenance, troubleshooting and control of repair systems, electronic board repairs, industrial electronics repairs, and obsolete control retrofits. New England Energy Management provides energy engineering design and consulting services. Can you imagine what an electrical business dealt with in 1929? It has only been about 30 years since electricity, it had only been in 1929, about 30 years since electricity had been brought into larger cities like Boston and New York. Much of America was still used oil lights and it was years before the WPA brought electricity to much of the United States. 
Piper Electrical Company has spanned an entire age of modernization while taking care of family, employees, and being part of the community. So congratulations on 95 years. It's an honor to receive this. Uh, I was lucky enough when I got out of the service to uh, work for my grandfather and take over his business a few years later. Um, very fortunate to have had uh, wonderful people working for me. Anything that this plaque would, uh, would reflect reflects on the people who work for me. Uh, nothing more can be said. We've got a good company because I've got good people. Thank you so much. Yeah. Super special thanks to Ellen of the Shirley Friendship Fund for interviewing these businesses and writing up the presentations. The other reason that we're here this morning is our breakfast with the boss. So two weeks ago, members of the chamber had the opportunity to tour the Federal Medical Center in Devons. I've had the opportunity to do this at least a half dozen times over my few years here at the chamber. Um, and Megan's, Megan and I have done it several times. And it is, every time that we go, it's a completely different experience and you learn something absolute, something new, um, and um, it's amazing the work that is done over there. Um, it's a very impressive tour, and I'm excited to hear from, the warden, from Warden Bowers today on how he leads 430 employees, as well as the care and custody of approximately 1,200 adults in custody. So without further ado, I invite up our interviewer extraordinaire, Jason Kelby of Kelby Communications. And F.J. Bowers, warden at the Federal Medical Center. When I was a reporter, we used to say there are no stupid questions. No, it's not. All right, I'll speak loudly. Good morning, warden. Good morning. How's business? Good. So, so your title is the Specialized Executive Services Warden, right? Yes, okay. well, that's just um, a little extra on to the board. Okay, yeah. right, but right. Just board. Okay, so tell us tell us about yourself. How did you get into this career? Where, where did you start life? And well, you um, up in yeah, I'm originally from Florida, um, Gainesville area. Go Gators. So, um, I started, um, I was working at a company called George Pacific, and um, during the time, they uh, Coleman, Florida, which is the largest complex in the Bureau was recruiting um, some staff. So I had a relative at the time actually was working for it in front of Bureau of Prison, which I'd never heard of it before. Um, so I actually applied, did an interview, and I was hired in 2005. And so in 2005, um, this is now uh, my 19th year coming up in March. I started in Coleman. I left there in uh, 2009 and went to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, left there in 2011 and went to Williamsburg, South Carolina. Williamsburg, South Carolina to Yazoo City, Mississippi. Uh, Yazoo City, Mississippi, I made a social board in Beaumont, Texas, which is a federal complex. Left there in 2017 and went to USP Atlanta. Um, in 2019, early 20, left and went to uh, Morgantown, West Virginia, which is known as the Kennedy Center yet there and as a warden and left there and went to Memphis, Tennessee in 2021 and reported here three months ago. So. Uh, how do you like the snow? Well, West Virginia kind of prepared me for the snow, so yes, I'm, I'm good, I'm good You're with good the snow. snow. Okay. Yeah, I've been Canadian for years, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So. so now in your bio, I believe it's what I read, it referred to your stints <clears throat> in the different states as tours. So were you there for like a set amount of time? You move around a lot. It sort of feels to me like the military. So, how does how does that work? With that? I would compare it to the military. Um, I pretty much did two years every stint. Um, pretty much average of two years. Okay. Right now, do I have to do two years? No. Um, I could have stayed at some locations longer, um, but to progress and go up the ladder, um, sometimes you have to bounce around and move move quite often. Okay. Yeah. Now, your your first position. Uh, in 2009 was a material handler supervisor at the Correctional Complex in Coleman, Florida. What does a material handler supervisor do? Well, it is actually an entry-level position. During the time, I didn't have any correctional experience. Um, I did have a 
a lot of experience in um, purchasing, which that's what it does. Also working in the commissary, um, and also you promote within. It's in the business of making money for the agency. Um, so material handling. Also, you work in the commissary. Anytime uh, adult in custody, custody uh, want to purchase anything from the commissary, you have to come to the commissary and you have to purchase those things, right? So in my line of work, it was about actually making money for the agency so we can get back to the agency. Um, and that's what that is, consists of. It's working warehouse, um, commissary, laundry. That's what it's consists of. Yes. Um, and so now you're at Devon's. Uh, how many people have been on a tour of the facility? <clears throat> I, I haven't been myself. Okay. I've been in other prisons, but not that one. <laughs> I wasn't in the House of Correction, but I was the Communications Director. Okay. So that was okay. Um, give us an overview of, of the mission and what differentiates this facility from, say, other federal prisons. Well, out of my nine, eight other institutions, Devon's is, is unique um, because it is a medical facility. Um, here we are an administrative um, institution. What that means, we bring guys from all over the United States with different custody levels to the institution to get whatever medical treatment and needs they need, right? Um, this is very unique. Um, Devon's has one of the only uh, dementia unit um, um, at Devon's. We also have uh, <coughs> Out of 122 institutions, we are the second institution to have a uh, sex offender program. Um, we do have a lot of sex offenders here. Um, what's unique with that is, um, if you work in any other institution, having a sex offender's yard, which we call it the institution, could be quite uh, problematic in certain different um, security levels, right? And so Devons is one of the unique institutions where we bring in those sex offenders to the institution and they don't have any problems there, right? We also have a, um, I would say, psychiatric hospital, 180 beds um, that we bring guys in that have it different um, problems mentally, also physically problems, physical problems. Um, uh, it's very unique. We also do restorations. Um, that is, um, guys who have not been actually sentenced um, to federal prisons, we actually um, actually bring them back to competence, right? So if the court deems that these guys is not competent enough to stand trial, uh, my psychology services and my um, psychiatry services actually try to um, deem if they're appropriate for uh, sentencing. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and what, so you bring people from all over the country. So if you're in federal prison and any medical services, you're brought here. Is this the only medical facility, or are there others? We have there is there is um, six other um, out of 122 institutions. Devons is um, one out of six medical facilities um, in the United States. Um, we have a medical facility in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Springfield, Missouri, Butler, South Carolina, and here. And now you, you have inmates, uh, so that probably any range of crimes, right, or convictions, yes, right? Yes, we do. Uh, we are administrative yard. We have guys from different custody levels, right? We can range from anything from tax evasion to robbery uh, to murder. You know, um, it just depends. Right. Right. Yes. And, and, but you also have uh, inmates who don't need medical care who get uh, put there, right? Yes. What, why is that? Like, why, would, why take up the space for them? Well, scary. we are a medical facility, but however, we do have general population beds as well. So our main um, uh, mission is medical, but we actually have guys that don't have that much medical um, needs as well. So uh, tell us about the facility then. It seems like maybe you have different uh, areas. So you've got the general general population maybe, but then your medical facility. Like how is it? How is it laid out? How do you control that environment and and, and having <clears throat> inmates of different different uh, convictions and, and security requirements? Like do, you, do they just all get put in one place, or do you, do you keep them you know separated? Okay. How does that work? Well, we have several um, housing units, right? Just wanted you to know that Devons was actually, you guys probably know if you're from this area, Devons, we acquired uh, the hospital from uh, the military base, 
and the prison was actually built around the military base to make it a medical facility. Um, we have several housing units, right? Um, one is the housing unit that we have. We have most of our um, stock program, which is our sex offender management program, um, guys. And then we also have, it's open bait. That means it's almost like military barracks, right? If you've ever been in the military barracks, there's no sales or anything. Everything is open, just individual slots where we have the beds. And then we also have a unit where you have um, locked doors, right? Um, we try to put those guys at more higher security level into those particular units, right? And then we have the secure mental health area, which um, we have different steps. Um, uh, the real critical, um, most severe guys that have mental health um, issues. And then we have a step down unit that, hey, not so severe, right? So they can go from um, N1, which we call our medical, um, medical facility, to N4. Like in five, right? And then in two is our pretty much um, dementia unit. And then we also have um, cells or where we actually house guys in the actual hospital area, right? So we have about five different areas that we actually hire. So the severe sick guys who can't really get around as much, we actually house them in the hospital, right? Mental health it has their own area, which is the end unit, and then we have the other um, two or three units. Yeah, so. okay. um, what, what are the security challenges of combining a prison in a hospital? I mean, I can think of a half dozen things in a hospital that you wouldn't want necessarily a prisoner to have. So how, how do you manage that? You know, sharps, medications, drugs? So uh, any hospital, um, you have uh, Pixis machines where the medication is locked behind a Pixis machine. Um, we have a lot of secure areas um, within within the institution. It is really not that difficult. Um, as we house um, some of the guys in housing units that's not adjacent to the hospital, um, and then we house the guys that, like I say, need medical um, needs in the hospital. Um, as far as um, security, we have no problem. Everything that we need, if we need to secure certain areas, we have the ability to do that. So sharps, um, if a guy is on, um, is a diabetic, right, on insulin, right, um, they would come down to medical, we would give them the insulin, and then we would dispose that sharp into this disposed um, container. Um, we do not allow inmates to walk around with sharps. So um, securing, my guys do a great job um, doing that. We are always um, looking at how can we um, advance security at the institution. Yes. And so what's a typical day like for, for one of your inmates? Say, say the guy getting the, the insulin shot. Like what, what's his day like from, you know, gets up and then he goes to bed? Well, insulin shot, you know, we have sick call, right? Sick call is where um, we have the guys report. Switch mics. We have, where we, so any any sick sick call, we actually have the guys report to medical, right? And when they report to medical um, daily, um, we do peel line on daily. Depends on what needs that the inmates need. Um, we put them on sick call. They report to medical, and we give them whatever medication uh, that they need. We also, um, and I think I failed to mention, we have a dialysis unit, right? Dialysis unit that have a roughly 20 beds that we run that six days a week, right? Um, a lot of guys that need kidney transplants or something of that nature, but we run the dialysis on a weekly basis, right? Uh, six days a week, three hours a day. Um, I don't know the exact many of guys we have um, on dialysis, but it's quite a bit. Yes. So, um, but and so, and so, do your uh, do the inmates also you know have work duty or? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, what, what else fills their days? Absolutely. So we want to employ every guy out there. You know, I don't mind. Sometimes you get in trouble, right? So we we encourage and we assign guys to different details throughout um, the complex. So just look at the prison as a town, right? You have a town where you have school. Right? You have the hospital, you have uh, recreation, right? Um, you have the chapel, 
right? So we're assigning these guys to get the food service, the commissary, which means the grocery store. We assign these guys based on some of experience to different. We have companions. Um, so in case we need to put guys on suicide watch, we actually do suicide watch companions, which is trained by psychology services. Um, uh, we have companions that help in medical with helping to assist other um, adults in custody on their needs. Um, they can't walk that well. You know, we assist them. We have pushers. We push them to different locations of the facility. So um, we employ, I would say, at least 75% of our, our adults in custody to various jobs um, throughout the institution. At the camp, um, in some institutions, you would see where they um, assign or have different Say chambers need help or something, we can do a memo of understanding that we can actually use some of our campers, which is outside the facility, can go and do certain things in the community as well. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so does that happen at Devons? Do you do that? Uh, we don't. Prior to COVID, we did. Um, prior to COVID, we did. That's something we would like to start start back. Um, we also would like to start the dog program back as well. What is a dog program is um, is to help veterans, right? We work with an organization to train dogs to assist veterans in whatever needs they um, they need. Um, uh, several facilities in the bureau actually does that, and we're trying to start that back here. So, excellent. And so, what's your what's your typical day like? My typical day like um, you never know, right? <laughs> you, you come in with the expectations of doing one thing, and then other things happen. Now, is they bad? No, typically they're not bad at this particular facility. Um, but it can be anything, right? It could be, I can get a call from central office, we need this documentation, we need you guys to meet for things, right? Um, inmate issues, staff issues, um, guys out in the hospital, um, do we have enough staff? And do Who's gonna sit on the guys? We do have a contract service, right? Um, so it's never a day you come to work and you know exactly what you're going to do. My job is more administrative, right? I have great staff, um, my exec staff. I have three associate wardens. I have a chief of security, which is my captain, and I also have my PIO, which is my executive assistant, um, which is through my public information officer. Um, but any given day, um, different things, different needs, different wants that we have, um, different problems, different programs that we're holding, hosting, uh, different tours that we're hosting. Um, just about two weeks ago, we actually had Senator Durbin's office, um, congressional um, staffers come to the institution um, to visit our institution to look at our First Step Act. Um, the First Step Act is an um, initiative that was I put into law in 2018 under President Trump. And so those First Step Act and those initiatives is actually trying to reduce recidivism rates um, for, our, for our inmates. So when they return back to society, they have some type of skills, and we feel like we have rehabilitated them because they're, we'll, some of them will be our neighbors one day. So we want to make sure we do all we can do to rehabilitate them. Right, and the, the Bureau of Prison uh, website said the recidivism rate is 43%, which I think is looking at the glass half empty because that means 50% of, 57% of the inmates released did not reoffend and return. So what is what do you think is the secret of uh, you know, sending a former inmate out into the community and not having them come back. I think programming. I think programming, um, um, giving them the tools that they need um, to acquire a job when they release um, from, from prison. Um, we have, like I say, several programs um, that we try to. We have job fairs um, come into the prison. We have interviews that come in. We have these guys get, if they don't have a driving license, or anything, we have a required driver license. Um, different areas, making sure they release and they have things put in place, right? So when they release, they have things to go to, jobs that they can actually be on. Our goal is to have more jobs that um, the community will allow or start recruiting some of our guys to work, right? Um, because if a guy doesn't work and doesn't have a job, they tend to get in trouble, right? Or they tend to do things illegal to do what? To provide and to make money. So our job is to give skills, provide skills. We have BT programs such as um, HVAC. Um, we have programs such as culinary arts, 
right? And we're trying to increase more and more programs to reduce recidivism rates. So you have a, a room full of employers here. Uh, <laughs> what, what's your pitch to them for giving a shot to a, a, an ex-con? Let's uh, use a term that I would use, probably you. Okay, yeah, well, well, I think everybody deserves a second chance, right? And some people are very skeptical about hiring someone who committed a federal crime because they don't know. Um, and I understand that. But I do think everybody deserves a second chance. You have really high-skilled guys that actually work at very articulate, um, very high skills, artists, contractors, um, different skills. And I think they can be of value to some of the companies. And, um, and I know they was passing along, there is some type of law to actually um, incentivize employers um, to hire ex-offenders, like tax breaks and that thing. So um, those are things that I think um, my director and the Senate and all those people trying to actually come up with to see what we can do to make sure that we give these guys a fair chance when they release from prison. Isn't it a challenge for you being here in Devons, but maybe your inmates are, uh, are from all around the country, so when they're released, they may not stay in this area. Are you trying to find them a job, say, in Arizona or whatever, or do you have a network set up for that? Yeah, so, so um, the Bureau, we have places in Arizona, right? And so we have halfway houses. If they release the halfway houses, we communicate directly to the halfway house to ensure, and then the halfway house also have the responsibility and to help these guys actually acquire a job um, when they release to that area. And so the halfway house also work, federal halfway house work in conjunction with the Bureau um, to try to help these guys um, acquire jobs. And uh, we also have a room full of business people who might be thinking, oh, I could contract with uh, the Federal Medical Center. How does that work? Is it? Is it uh, to get involved in the federal system? Yes, um, we do have a contracting department, right? And we also have a, the national contracting um, department, which is called the Federal Acquisition Office in Green, um, Grand Prairie, Texas, right? And so what we do, anytime you want to acquire a contract with the Bureau of Prisons or in a federal agency, there is a bidding process that you go through, right? You have to register through SAMS to ensure that you can actually bid through those processes, right? Um, those are out of my hand um, because I don't want to uh, be caught as far as um, what you guys did, I give you a contract and then I'm in prison for bribery, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so what we do, we go through the same process. We go through the same process. Um, it's anonymous bid. You bid on what you want. Um, and then we have acquisition field office actually deal with that particular branch of um, contract. So, now, I wanted to get back to a, a question on the medical care. Uh, you know, obviously something like uh, dialysis or insulin is, is something an inmate needs, right? To live. Yes. But in medical care, there's also elective um, procedures that an inmate might want. Uh, what's what's the policy on that? How, how is that decided as to what kind of you know prisoner might need versus what they want. But do you have a particular? Well, I don't know. You're reading, you're reading <laughs> in the newspapers about sex change operations, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can say that you can't. But now yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, it's, it's, it's been an issue in Massachusetts with the state. I wonder how this fits in. Well, we don't make decisions locally. All our decisions is made through others, and we have to abide by their, their rules. Um, the issue of sex change, and I don't want to go too far in that, so um, just experience, past experience that I've had. If a person is already in transition when they become incarcerated, right? Um, we have to finish that transition, right? Um, is it right? You know, a matter of opinion, but we have to actually finish those transitions uh, that they was once. No, you can't come into prison and just all of a sudden I want to have it because it's cheap, right? It's taxpayers' money, I want to have it. That's not the way that works. You have to show proof and you have to show that you was already in the process of, of doing that. It's almost like if, if a guy come in and he has kidney problems, right? Right? We do kidney transplants, right? Our job is to make sure that we're doing everything we can to what? Uh, be humane. Um, and so we put those things in place and so we offer certain transplants here in the mass area because you guys have so many wonderful hospitals here. Um, and so, and that's the reason why they bring in guys and 
I would say in this area because we have that ability to do so. We're not in a rural area. Oh, okay, so to explain, let's explore that a little bit more. What's your relationship then with the hospitals in the area and in Boston? How do you use those facilities? Well, we have a national con we have a contract with the hospitals, and that cons that contract has a a lot of different hospitals under the umbrella of um, I want to say our main contract is. It's mass, UMass, right? And so with UMass, um, UMass have a, several hospitals that falls under their umbrella, um, from my understanding. So um, that is a bit in process as well. Um, what hospital we use is based on what condition and what the adult in custody needs, right? Um, anytime we probably do a transplant, it's going to probably go to Beth Israel, probably. Um, I'm not too familiar with the hospitals. I've only been here for three months. Okay. Um, but say if something's not so minor, if something minor, we'll go to Nishnova, right? And we will go, um, if I say this right, is it Worcester? Worcester. 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 You know, just strictly a prison versus what the hospital is. Like, what's your overall budget? What maybe how much is healthcare versus <laughs> running a prison? So the overall budget for uh, Devis was ninety-five billion dollars last year um, to operate um, that facility. Uh, my uh, authorized positions is over five hundred. It's about five hundred and twenty-five employees. We're currently about four hundred plus. We're about ninety-five. 91 uh, positions um, shy of the 525. So we are hiring so, um, in various jobs. Um, our breakdown, correctional services um, for those are the correction officers. Um, our complement is about 200 correction officers and correctional services, which that is a foundation of the institution because that's what we do. We can, you know, we, we contain their correction officers. Our medical department is about 100, I would say 50 um, uh, medical staff. It consists of medical doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists. If you name it, we have it. We even have psychiatry. Um, we have psychologists. And a very other jobs as far as our teachers, our food service, our chaplains, our programming areas, right? And so um, different areas. But our main foundation of the institution is correctional services also in medical because that's what we do but we have various other departments that we also have as well so all right thank you so much let's give a round of applause for <laughs> token gift. I assure you I'm not trying to bribe you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it is not valued at even close to $50, so, uh, so no worries. Okay, so you no worries, no bribes. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm only coming back for a tour and not for a lengthy stay. I okay, okay. <laughs> Because the tours are amazing, and I know we'll end up doing another one. And so, when we do that, they only come, it usually only comes around once a year. Um, when we do that, it's definitely I highly encourage um, anybody to to participate. Um, thank you so much, Jason and Warden Bowers. Great information today. Suddenly, the microphone's going to work perfectly. <laughs> Apologies um, for that. Um, I know that's stressful for our speakers too. So. Um, thank you, of course, to the team here at the Hilton Garden Inn. Um, thank you to Air Public Access for joining us and recording today's event. Barry. <laughs> He's amazing. He's like Barry. Very special thanks, of course, to our Breakfast with the Boss speaker sponsor, Fidelity Bank. And in closing, did you know that today, February 7th, is National Send a Card to a Friend Day? So on the tables, we have piles of cards, and we would love for you to take a card. Um, the envelopes are on the table out in the front, um, and feel free to send a friend a card today. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next, next breakfast on Wednesday, April 3rd, 
I'm 99% sure it's going to be here. So where are we going to go? Not to the Devon's Common Center. Uh, so have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Thank you. And just to remind you,